Okay, so I'm going to talk uh, um, a bit about some some work we've been, myself and some colleagues are doing, exploring this concept of embodied agents, uh, which for science, and it's a pretty pre rather preliminary, but I, I hopefully it will stir some some uh, some thoughts. So, so first I'll say a few words about what an embodied agent is, uh, or at least in our perspective, and then talk about some of the explorations that we're we're doing with them. So, uh, see if I can work out how to use this. So, this is what an an embodied agent, a computational system that can interact with its environment and learn from its interactions. Uh, and so uh, computational system, so it's a persistent stateful system running on a computer, I suppose. Uh, it can sense and act with its environment. So it's not just uh, sitting in a computer by itself. Um, the environment could be physical, uh, like scientific instruments uh, in our case, uh, or it could be virtual. I'll give some examples of that. And uh, and then it can learn, which means it's able to, it's got some memory and can adapt its responses. Um, so that, of course, a, a account, that de definition accounts for all sorts of things. Uh, a lot of robotic people talk about embodied agents, but uh, our interest is in applying them in science. So let's, let's, I'll give a series of increasingly sophisticated examples. So here's, here's a, Let's see if I can make this work. This is something we're playing with at Argon uh, self-driving labs for um, for various biological and physical science problems. This is fun. On the the right is a the real lab, and on the left is uh, a, a, a virtual twin of it, so a digital double. Uh, for some reason, we make this run faster. Actually, it's actually slower. But uh, so, if you look very carefully, you can see what it, the thing is doing. By the way, it's mixing coloured liquids. Not a very interesting thing to be doing. Uh, but we're doing this in a. Uh, see if I can make this move. Virtual camera is a lot more stable. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We. The, the student running this, I said, we need a video. So he ran in and he did a very good one. But of course, it wasn't very. Uh, well uh, stabilized, um, uh, but uh, anyway, so the problem is that we're doing right here is, uh, so we're working with a whole lot of self-driving lab groups at Argonne National Lab, and you know they're doing mixing dangerous chemicals and mixing uh, biological samples, but in the research, what we call the rapid prototyping lab, we only work with non-dangerous thing. So we're mixing colored pigments. So we, the, the application is you take a, give it a color and it conducts a, a series of experiments where it mixes ran, initially randomly selected sets of RGB um, and, and then um, photographs it and decides what it should do next. So very good. And of course, if you thought about this, you could work out, you could probably do this on a few, uh, very simple uh, goes, but it's using some simple uh, machine learning method. So it takes a while to get it, but you can see how it's improving over time um, Well, not improving. I know I think it is improving in this case as it does these experiments. So this, this is what, this is the actual apparatus we have. So this is in a sense, is it's, this is its environment. We've got a whole set of uh, liquid handling robots, uh, plate handlers, um, a robotic arm somewhere. Uh, oh yes, that's the PF400. And we've actually been doing some interesting work organizing these things into modular uh, deployments so you can mix and match different apparatus, but that's not so relevant to what we're talking about here. So that's that. Let's see, can I move this? Yes. And uh, you know, we're running some simple uh, logic um, where we, uh, repeatedly running this experiment and at some point here there's some logic that will say uh oh actually maybe it's higher up well so there's some logic here that says decide what to what colors to mix to mix next based on the photos that you've taken previously anyway so so uh very simple logic do i have that oh yes and this is you know and then we can run experiments with uh but so what, what are we doing here? We're running experiments with different batch sizes. Um, and you know, of course, some converge much faster than, than others. Um, not 
the details are not important. So what have we got here? We've got a computational system. So there is the, there's a, a server, an agent that's sitting here and it's taking uh, these results of these experiments. Um, it knows about the robots and how to control them. It's able to image samples um, and control robots. It can also publish data. Um, and well, it can learn in the sense it can run an optimizer. And of course, so, so it's not really a very intelligent agent, but as we all know nowadays, if you can run a simple optimizer, you're doing AI. So that's, uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's okay. So it's doing AI, not really, but so here's another example. Um, this is uh, work that we have been doing with a fellow called Arvind Ramanathan at Argon. Um, uh, an AI uh, guided uh, molecular dynamics uh, simulation. So it's a quite, it was a Gordon Bell uh, entry, maybe a winner, I can't remember, uh, at the supercomputing conference. So the interest here is in um, understanding the structure of uh, proteins um, using molecular dynamics, but rather than simply start a simulation at some random state and run it forward and observe all the states it goes through as it jiggles around, you uh, you run a whole series of them, actually an ensemble of them all at once, and then you map their states that they visit into this uh, into sort of a, a machine learned a latent space and decide which of the states are interesting to continue and which should be abandoned. So uh, you're using this machine learned latent space to guide the, uh, the progress of the simulation. Then what you find out is that over time you can, uh, this deep drive MD code is so called, uh, is able to uh, explore much more of the population uh, than a system that simply starts from, from nothing and, and proceeds uh, without any guidance. Uh, and you can end up with uh, massive uh, uh, speed ups uh, relative to uh, other state of the art uh, approaches. So machine, machine, learn, uh, machine learning guided or AI, as you might say, guided uh, simulations is in a sense, another example of an embodied uh, agent. Um, and here, of course, the state is just the results of simulations. Um, well, we can we can control our environment by starting and killing simulations, and uh, we've got this uh, variational order encoder learned uh, latent space that we're is how we're we're learning things. And now let's go to a different. So so uh, so those are just a couple of introductory examples. So my my interest is or our interest more broadly is thinking well. If we can use these sort of machine learning methods to uh, do things like guide a series of experiments or guide a series of simulations, you know, what else could we uh, use them to do? Uh, and uh, of course, some of the things that scientists do that are mundane and boring, maybe are pipetting liquids to uh, control uh, to, to, to mix colors or do something more interesting. But they also do lots of other, other things uh, like, um, well, we've talked about the first two Organize data, well, search the literature for data and protocols, design a protocol for an experiment, formulate hypotheses, uh, work out why things aren't working. Um, so maybe we could uh, apply AI uh, techniques to some of those uh, things as well. So let's look at how we might do those things. So, yeah, so this brings us to um, large language models, which of course are the flavor of the month, um, the month, the year. <laughs> but actually are uh, quite exciting. Um, and I probably most of you are quite familiar with uh, what what they do, you know, these uh, generative uh, uh, AI methods that uh, are trained on large amounts of, uh, well, maybe uh, web text often, but increasingly also other things, scientific articles, maybe scientific data and so forth. Um, with uh, people keep, keep finding that as you scale up the size of these models and the amount of information that that's trained on, that they keep seeing, keep, we keep discovering things that they can do quite well, uh, you know, that we might not have expected them to be able to do. So early on, it was things like uh, translate from one language to another, and then it was understand, well, answer questions about uh, scientific, uh, or to, about uh, texts, um, do many other, generate, you know, apparently, uh, 
readable text, um, answer questions about things. Uh, it, it seems, you know, at least for now, they, as we make them bigger and learn how to train them better and so forth, they keep being able to do uh, more things. So we've been interested in how you might, what you might be able to use these for, for in the scientific context. But first of all, let me show you this. Uh, oh yeah, so here's a, um, here's an, actually one thing that, this is a very trivial example, but it's quite nice. Uh, a group in Toronto said, uh, well, let's see if we can um, use these uh, large language models to generate um, uh, control procedures for scientific apparatus, just like the ones I showed you earlier for mixing liquids. Um, so they took a, this is an English language description of a protocol. Obviously it's not one that you'd find in a scientific article, but it's very similar. <laughs> Maybe more in a children's book, but uh, you know, take uh, 15 grams of acetic acid, add 30 grams of red cabbage solution and stir for 20 seconds. And then you, tell the system that you've got uh, the available hardware is a beaker and a stir bar, and you say convert to XDL. This is a, a, um, a chemical protocol description language developed by some people at the University, University of Glasgow, and it generates this material. So it's sort of, we haven't told it anything about XDL, but apparently it, it's been trained on literature, so it knows what XDL is, that's sort of impressive. Um, and it generates this, it makes some mistakes, uh, which I won't go into the details of. What's it is, I think, using some container that we it doesn't have. It's got some uh, syntactic errors. Um, so, but what you can, what this group showed you could do, you could use a thing called iterative prompting. Uh, what does that mean? Well, you say, basically, you know, thanks for what you just generated. I don't know why. I always want to be polite to these things. It's obviously I'm uh, anthropomorphizing in a way I shouldn't be, but 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 you know here's some mistakes you made. Can you fix it? And so and the way that this group did it is they had a little program that runs over the output and generates error messages. And that, so you then say uh, you pass back the error messages. The hardware section should only contain component tags. The solid property is not allowed, etc. Uh, and then you run it again and you get some more error messages uh, and then you keep going until you end up with actually an executable uh, set of uh, XDL. So it's such a trivial example that it's perhaps not too convincing, but it does suggest that you know, there are ways of using these models to do interesting things, um, at least something interesting for experimental science. Um, and then another technique that people have been using quite a bit is retrieval augmented generation. Uh, so this is a, uh, you know, you're not in rag. Uh, so this is also, I think I find quite interesting. So, um, so it's a similar idea in that you're gonna ask a question of your large language model. Oops, um, couldn't like this, but you're gonna give it some supporting material, uh, you know, like a, a page out of a document or something. Um, and these models now seem to be able to make good use of the supporting material. And uh, the way they do this is in this retrieval of meta generation is um, you have uh, a, uh, a, an embedding model, a model that will map a piece of text into a, a multi-dimensional uh, space of sort of concept space. You uh, map your query into one vector uh, and map a whole series set of documents. Um, and here I've got a question which I came, found online. Uh, I don't have an XC60, but maybe it's a set of pages from Volvo uh, manuals. And then you pass, you get the the Volvo manual pages that are closest to uh, your query and pass that into the uh, large language model along with your question and you end up with an answer that turns out to be quite correct. Um, so of course, we're not interested in Volvo XC60s, but we, I, I think a future um, thing we may be seeing a lot of is people taking large amounts of scientific data and, and, and documents and 
similarly doing retrieval of meta generation on, on, on those things. Well, let's carry on to the next uh, thing. Probably people's ch children use play Minecraft. Maybe some people here do. I haven't myself, but uh, I'm. so this is what this is. Uh, obviously, uh, it's someone doing something in this virtual world called Minecraft. Um, it's doing a whole series of things, uh, which you can read down the bottom if you can see catching fish, uh, hunting a pig, etc. Um, but what's it, this is basically a result from a. Uh, this is a video. So now, if you nowadays, if you publish a paper, as you probably know, you don't just publish a paper. You have to have a, a web page. It should have some videos, some tweets, and all this. So, so they had a video. That video, um, but it's a it's a, a, a wonderful group at Caltech and Nvidia, um, where they basically used uh, some of the techniques we've just been describing to train uh, a model to play Minecraft. And basically, by doing experiments, uh, you're trying things, and then uh, seeing what happens, and then building on that 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 result uh, to um, to do better next time. And in the way it what what's interesting interesting is the way they do it. They uh, they try think they write they basically generate some Minecraft code to do something, and they try to do it. And if it works, then they put that Minecraft code into their sort of uh, their state, their memory, uh, and then the next as a skill. And the next time they do it, they they use that, try using that skill and some other skills and, and do better things. So you could certainly imagine, and this is, we have some students trying this, doing something similar, but now trying to learn how to operate equipment in a lab rather than playing playing games. And, you know, this is all, this most of this would only make sense to uh, as someone who played Minecraft, but, I guess the idea is, you know, over time you're supposed to learn how to make the forms of tools, and once you've got tools, then you can do other things. And and they show they can build skills using many fewer iterations and more sophisticated skills than than other other techniques. So let's see. Yeah, and the, the way they, uh, I won't go into too many details, but you know, they they use large language models, GPT-4 in this case, saying, well, tell me what to do. This is taught, here's a bit of information about Minecraft. You know more from the, what you were trained on. You know, trying to discover as many new things as possible. And as they, as time goes on, they build up little bits of code that they build into what they call their, uh, I think their um, their skill library, and then use those to to go forward. Well, I think that's pretty fun. So uh, maybe I'll skip this. Oh, yeah, but well, maybe this is interesting. So the in this case, the input prompt they provide is very simple. Um, so this is the English language prompt they give to the model. Now I want to discover as many diverse things as possible. Uh, I have a current state, which tells me what the Minecraft agent has um, some capabilities, uh, equipment. It knows a little bit about its environment. It knows what it's already tried and what succeeded and failed. Uh, and off it, off it goes. Okay. I'm not going in the... So here we have, uh, so in this case, we've to sort of go treat this as an embodied agent. So it's able to run Minecraft programs and retrieve results. Its uh, environment consists of Minecraft and ChatGPT, and it's learning by building up this collection of, uh, of sk skills, programs that it, that it can run. So let's go on here. So, so this is the moment when I when I talk about Globus. Thank you. Everybody, everybody wake up. <laughs> wake up. No. So, uh, so you know my my a perspective on on building out a scientific assistant of this sort is it needs to be able to assess and learn many skills, and and it also needs to be able to interact in in a large, potentially distributed, resource rich environment. So, you know, in the example I, sh I showed earlier, those included uh, various forms of scientific uh, apparatus, data stores, computers, um, perhaps remote computers in the case of the uh, molecular dynamics code, we are running on multiple supercomputers in different places and, and so forth. So, so we need uh, better do a few things. So scientific embodied agents, I would argue, need to be able to act reliably 
and I'm not sure what that says, and securely, yes, in a global science ecosystem. So they've got to be able to act on resources, uh, computers, storage systems, execute uh, sequences of actions or individual actions reliably, you know, retrying as needed, and then very important, manage who is trusted to do what, uh, where, and, and when. And for this, we rely on uh, with this uh, Globus ecosystem we've developed. If I can, why is, oh, there we go. Oh yeah, so I point out some of the reasons why this is hard, but I'll skip over that. Um, so uh, who here uses Globus to move data? Come on, the rest of you need to get moving. So uh, no, you know, this is a, Globus is a system that uh, will, widely used to move data. There's some, I think, 50 storage, 50,000 storage systems worldwide that uh, uh, have Globus agents deployed. Um, but also now increasingly used to uh, manage, perform remote computation. Um, but the key, the key uh, elements that makes it work well and that make it interesting also for embodied agents is we've got these local Globus agents in many places and they're very easily deployed. We have this, uh, hybrid architecture in which cloud hosted, Amazon hosted um, management services uh, coordinate things so that if things fail, we can restart. And then this quite sophisticated distributed authentication or delegation mechanism for controlling who's allowed to do what. So delegation, the basic idea is you don't want the human to have to uh, you know, carefully give approval for every action that is to be performed, but you also need to be able to control carefully. You don't want your agent uh, doing things without human permission in different places. So you have protocols that allow you to say, well, I give certain rights to this uh, um, agent, the embodied agent in this case, to act on my behalf in, in, in different uh, settings. And so this allows us to do things like the following. So, uh, so here's a set of resources we want to work on. Perhaps this is storage, compute, storage, maybe a, a robot, an external service, as we call it. Here's a flow, a sequences of actions. What are they? Uh, data transfer, compute, um, perhaps a robotic actions, uh, cataloging. We can uh, specify uh, Let's see, we'll get a minute. Yeah, there we go. Manage the credentials to say who's allowed to do what. And away we go. Oh, yes. And this is by quite widely used. So we've issued 1.3 billion access tokens to, to date. So this is not an academic uh, toy. This is a production service operated by the University of Chicago. But let's go. Uh, so I'm not, now I'm going to to sort of continue this aside on, uh, on um, reliable execution mechanisms and talk about how we're applying them to self-driving labs. So you know, for years we were using these mechanisms to uh, move and manage data. Then we started using them to move and manage computation. And now we're using them to move and manage uh, labs like the ones I showed earlier. And I don't do this well, but you saw the videos. Uh, and this is what it looks like um, in behind the covers. So here's the various robotic pieces, each of which is encapsulated as an agent. Oh, that's interesting. I moved forward. All right, move backwards. To that. So these are our, uh, in this case, the, act, the systems we want to act on. They're each encapsulated as a, uh, a virtual uh, entity that can be operated on. And then this is the, uh, the flow that we're running in this case. Running, running a sequence of actions, doing some AI inference, storing data, and then repeating until we uh, until we're done. And of course, compute and data are using regular Globus actions. These other things are using robotic actions. Let's keep going. Okay. So now I want to change topic, uh, sort of totally, but it's actually a next step, as you'll see. So one of the things we've been working to apply embodied agents to uh, is, um, and this is very much a, a work in progress. It's work of my colleague, Avan Ramanathan and several students whose photos I didn't have when I put this together, but I'll introduce their names. 
Um, and it pulls in all these same ideas of dealing with uh, uh, large language models, controlling robots, and uh, running simulations. So uh, the so I, I'm going to say a few words about antimicrobial peptides. If you put it on me, you might find I don't know much more than what's on this slide, but I may fool some of you at least that I know what I'm talking about. But, so, an, an, but anyway, an antimicrobial peptide uh, is a or short uh, amino acid, um, a sequence of amino acids that uh, apparently people are finding is good at targeting and, and killing various pathogens. Um, and the interest in, in our work is uh, designing one of these things that can kill some specified set of uh, bacterial strains or viruses or other things without harming uh, host cells. Um, and so it's it's sort of an, it's an interesting combinatorial problem. There's a very large number of possible combinations and understanding, well, you need to understand, first of all, you know, can the one you've designed actually penetrate the, the, uh, the bacterial wall? And this is a very frustrating video because it keeps, it almost gets down and then it stops and recycles. So I don't know what actually happens, but in other longer simulations, actually it does manage to penetrate. Um, so of course, some of these things you can, some of these questions you can ask about simulation, but for other things, you need to understand the bacterial, uh, the whole internal um, structure of a bacteria and the, um, metabolic pathways and other things that are going on in, inside. The sort of information you would, a scientist would get from reading the literature, for example. So this uh, system that we're developing sort of combines, well, it's basically, as I say here, taking a rational design approach um, and saying, well, this is how a human might approach it. You might use your knowledge of bacterial cell membrane composition and structure. So you can build these simulations. Um, Something about uh, intracellular pathways that you might get by uh, literature search. Okay, so the embodied agent that we're building for this purpose um, is going to be using uh, queries like this posed to a large language model, ChatGPT. Um, we have a separate project where we're busy training our own large language models not just on the web, like uh, ChatGPT is uh, trained, lots well, other things as well, but but also large amounts of scientific literature, which we hope will do better in answering these questions. But even ChatGPT, ChatGPT can do quite well. So you can see the sort of questions. You know, a particular peptide is a known antimicrobial. What is its most likely mechanism mechanism of action? And you'll get back an answer. You can parse that and use that to guide the next chat, uh, next steps. Um, so these are sort of method questions, if you like, and then down here we've got things like define a protocol to validate the proposed answers to these questions, and that would do things more like I was showing you earlier in the uh, simple protocol uh, design. And then later on, run these protocols in a self-driving lab, which we were doing with the color mixing, uh, for example. So let's see. Uh, so we've our uh, student Priyanka um, Sethi has been building uh, is building a series of agents. We keep reusing this word agent to mean different things. That's a bit confusing, but uh, things that would be called by our embodied agent to do uh, things like, for example, um, answer questions from the liter literature. So, so uh, you've got a peptide. Uh, and you want to know something about its uh, methods of action. Um, and so there's a this simple action. You first of all query PubMed uh, to, which is a large collection of biomedical literature, to find articles that reference this that peptide. And then you use this concept of retrieval augmented generation to ask ChatGPT to build hypotheses. Uh, yeah, so given this information, information in this paper, uh, you know, given that A, which organism is this may this be acting on, um, or some other similar question. So very simple, but uh, actually uh, can be quite effective. And then there's other uh, agents that do things like um, 
you know, set up a simulation um, to uh, test a particular mechanism, uh, maybe query genomic data sets rather than you know, textual databases and find uh, the similarity between one uh, genomic sequence and, a, and another. And then in other cases, we're running, uh, we're running AlphaFold, the original run, the AlphaFold, which we have running as an agent on some of our computers to uh, perform other, other queries. Let's see, now I think we have, well, this is, uh, goes into more detail on what some of these agents do. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of, uh, I won't read through this list, but there's a, they can be quite complex sequences of tasks. Okay. At the moment, we're hand coding these based on the knowledge of the biologist, but you could imagine the agent learning them perhaps. I'm still not sure whether that would work, but in the Voyager example, we are generating code to, uh, that can be used to perform various skills. So maybe we can learn these skills uh, in that automatic method, automatic uh, way here as well. Okay, so. Uh, another one, which I'll, I think I'll skip over. So anyway, so here we, uh, so we've got these various so-called agents. Um, we can uh, invoke them um, in some, each of which, well, each of which I say yeah, queries databases, retrieves data, runs simulations, runs experiments. Um, we can link them together as we do using uh, one of these Globus flows that I already mentioned. So that will take a set of peptides as input. Um, this is at the moment supplied. So these are potential candidates. It will um, you know, ask some questions of PubMed and interpret the results. It will then align the results, predict structure, rank results. Then it will do some simulations to evaluate results. And it will come up with a set of candidates for experimental evaluation. Um, and then it can run, uh, oh, so this is just showing that thing running, which is not especially interesting. It's running one thing after another, but it is automated. Uh, and then we'll, whoops. Then the next thing we want to do is to run an experiment on our self-driving lab. And this time, in this case, we're doing it in the, uh, the bio space where we're allowed to run uh, biological protocols. Sorry, Ian, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, is that just a prop picture or do you actually have Samanova systems in, in your facilities? Oh, we do have Samanova systems, yeah. Yeah, yeah we've got this, um, and we could talk about if it's of interest, we've, we've got this uh, AI uh, test bed, which has got quite a few different systems. And if you can want access, I'm sure we can arrange for it. We've got quite a large uh, array of uh, Sam and Nova systems. It's good to see someone's paying attention. <laughs> so this is, uh, you know, this is um, a protocol. The, this is one of the protocols you would run. Um, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you're going to compare the, this is actually not uh, with a antimicrobial peptide, but another uh, thing. But we, you know, you, you try growing uh, you know, a particular um, bacteria with and without uh, additions. Um, then we, getting the results, we then may go back and generate additional experiments. So we've got all of this uh, running in our lab, but I'd say it's still, we're able to run the individual steps, but I, I don't think we're at any point where we feel that we're, discovering new antimicrobial peptides. So whether we can do that or not will depend on a lot more uh, evaluation, but I, I feel it's quite an encouraging uh, direction at least to be pursuing. So in this example, what have we got? We've got, uh, we've got our embodied agent. Uh, that's maybe some human bits of it in there, but it's still uh, running these different uh, components of designing a peptide and, and just, designing an experiment or choosing an, exper an experiment to run it. It's running a whole very variety of different uh, simulations, querying databases, controlling robots. Um, and it's at least developing new knowledge. It's maybe not yet at the point of learning new skills, but we'd like to think it, it can be. And of course, it's working in this environment that includes quite a, a range of things. Uh, 
HPC data repositories, robots, and, and instruments. Let's see. Okay, so that's uh, all I'm going to say about embodied agents, actually. I think, I hope I can get some of you excited about working on, on these things. I, you know, I, we see, I see, my colleagues see a, a future in which we build more and more of these agents and then develop more and more sophisticated methods for um, uh, linking them together and deciding how to and invoke them in, in sequence. Uh, another interesting question, which is, well, I don't think is mentioned here, is uh, as we do more and more of this retrieval of augmented generation, I can imagine well, we're starting to build up large databases of these uh, vectors that encode the contents of the documents uh, in terms of the concepts that they implement. And so you could imagine you know, collections of you know, tr trillions of these vectors encoding the, the contents of different uh, scientific documents or data sets. And perhaps that will be the way in which we you know, find out what knowledge is available where uh, for the problems that we're trying to, to solve. Let's see. So obviously these are the questions that one could talk about if you were starting to apply these at, at scale. Um, if we really had embodied agents that were decided designing experiments, you would be concerned about uh, whether they're doing so safely. So then, for example, in materials, you might someone might decide they want to design a new energy storage uh, material. But of course, if your energy, if you have a a material that has too high an energy density, it would also make a good explosive, and that would be a fair thing. Um, and there have been already some interesting studies where people have tried to use large language models to design, um, well, actually, not large language models, it was materials design systems to design uh, pathogens and found out that they actually seem to be able to discover design pathogens quite effectively that people were not uh, aware of. Um, but I think more, those are. Of course, big concerns, but maybe for computer scientists, we might think, well, what, what will these new research assistants be good at and what will they be bad at? I don't believe we're going to be replaced by these things, but perhaps uh, we may want to think about which things we'd like to hand off to these sorts of uh, in, in agents. And then, uh, you know, this question of what our research infrastructure would look like if it's going to be used by these systems. Uh, so I suspect most of your research infrastructure here, and certainly most of the argon is designed to be used by people. Um, and of course, people will still be very active, but you, know, you could have a, if you had a lab that had a thousand instruments in it that could just be driven around the clock, that might uh, lead to different it's sorts of grant discoveries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's a certain perverted uh, uh, economics at work in, in uh, Pay them less than we pay a computer system for us. Yes, yes. So I, I visited Ann Arbor uh, University of Michigan a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking about this. And this guy said, "I, I, I reckon I can, I can design a, a self-driving lab that can replace a, a microbiologist easily. I just need four software engineers and four and six electrical engineers." <laughs> so the economics are not quite there yet. In his view. Um, but yeah, so this is a sort of a final, uh, maybe philo more philosophical. So you, you, I'm sure many people who talk about AI imply seem to they seem to imply that we're building machines to replace people, um, but I think it's more to complement human uh, capabilities. If someone said, you know, scientists uh, AI won't replace scientists, but scientists who use AI will replace those who don't, and maybe similarly for these sort of embodied agent uh, type things. Which is something that Licklider said in 1960, which is a long time, a long time away, a long time ago. But you can't read that because it's at the bottom of the screen. Do you know Licklider was a sort of pioneer in the internet and other other things? Um, and he 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 wrote this uh, paper about well he called it man computer symbiosis. We would call it maybe human computer symbiosis now. Um, and talks about you know ways in which uh, it's really quite forward-looking uh, about ways in which humans and computers can complement each other's uh, capabilities. Okay, thank you.